All right, so we'll, we're going to jump right into the first question. And the first question is, why did God allow sin to enter into a perfect world? Why do you think Adam sinned? Adam sinned because he chose to sin. It was not an accident. The Bible is clear. Eve was deceived. Adam was not. 1 Timothy chapter 2, <coughs> excuse me, 13 and 14. Now, sin was allowed because the angels had to understand how God functions. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's read verses 11 and 12. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. This will tell us that the Old Testament prophets, while they were writing, did not fully understand what they were writing. But they had to be told they were writing for another generation. So we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We read verses 11 and 12. Read very, very carefully. Do you have that? 1 Peter 1, 11 and 12. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you. Finish that verse. With the Holy Ghost come down from heaven, come on, which things the angels desire to look into, which is the gospel. The angels do not understand everything. Now, compared to us, their minds are like encyclopedias, don't misunderstand me, but they don't understand everything. And so when Lucifer fell and the Lord threw him out, they did not understand whether or not he was justly treated. As a matter of fact, Ellen White writes in Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1149, paragraph 10, it was only when they saw what, Lucy, what Satan did to Christ on the cross that the last strings of sympathy with Satan were cut. Imagine this. For 4,000 years and more, there were angels in heaven who felt Lucifer had been unfairly treated. God had to allow sin. That's the reason why God allowed Cain to live. That the universe may see what happens as sin proceeds and progresses. It's a painful thing for God because he hates sin. Hebrews 1 verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And the things we hate, we try to avoid. God cannot avoid sin. That's why when all the wicked are finally destroyed, including Satan, but before he, dest he is destroyed, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall finally confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That has to happen. And for that to happen, sin has to be seen for what it really is. So that those of us who are saved, having seen what sin does, we will choose to live in a world where sin will never return again. Mm -hmm. So God had to let it happen and proceed. Yes. And God always knows best. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why to please God, you must interact with him by faith. Amen. Because he's God, we're not. And there's so much. We, it's like children and parents. Children do not understand why the father or the mother said no. The parent understands, the child doesn't. Next question. All right. Well, let's jump right into some controversy. Let me say something before we get into the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> the question also, why did Adam sin? Adam put someone ahead of God. Genesis 3 verse 17, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. God said, You listen to someone else instead of me. I hate to harp on this, but let me harp. When you observe Sunday, you're listening to someone else instead of God. Mm -hmm. And I leave it at that. Yes, Pastor. All right. What is your opinion on the vaccine? I have no opinion. <laughs> I'll tell you what the church's official position is. You must make an individual choice based on praying to God for guidance, following the health laws, the counsels of Ellen White, 
and then making your individual decision. That's the position of the church. And I am no position to go against the church because I see nothing sinful about that counsel. Make your individual decision. Remember Psalm 32 verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. Psalm 25 verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. James 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. Jeremiah 33 verse 3. Call unto me. And I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest. Ask God, should I take the vaccine? Amen. He will convict you one way or the other because your body belongs to him. Amen. Amen. All right. What do you think is the reason we are losing members, our members? And, and what is your solution? John 12. Well, the Bible has a solution. I don't have one. <laughs> John 12, verse 32. And I... If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The first application of that verse is crucifixion. He was lifted up on the cross. It also means lift him up when you preach, lift up truth. Truth will draw people to Christ. In uh, the Great Controversy, page 509, paragraph 1, Ella White writes, Conformity to worldly custom never convert, converts the church to the world. It never converts the world to Christ. Let me say that again. Conformity to worldly custom converts the church to the world. It never converts the world to Christ. When you mingle the things of God with the secular things, you weaken the power of the message and people drift. Are you following me? God called the Israelites to be different. And they said to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Make us a king to judge us like the other nations. When you're called to be different and you act as though you want to be like everybody else, it is an insult to God. You are desiring a path contrary to the one for which God brought you into existence to be different. And so we lose members because we drift from the truth. I was conducting an evangelistic series <clears throat> in a certain church in Canada. And I told them we'll meet every night for three weeks. And they said every night. So there's little opposition to that. So the pastor said, come and talk to the members. So I flew to the city where it was and sat down and met with them. And uh, they gave me all kinds of reasons why they can't come every night. I said to one, when can you come? Tuesday night. Well, you come on Tuesday night. When can you come? Wednesday. Well, you come on Wednesday. But I can't shut down the meeting because you cannot come on the Thursday. So we have the meeting. And the pastor of that meeting told me, in the third week of all the meetings they have had in the past the average attendance at night was about 30 people we averaged 160 people because all I did was to do what give them thus saith the Lord that's no joke there's God listening to me I was called to do an evangelistic series in Minneapolis and one night the executive secretary or ministerial director of the conference came and he saw the people. So he asked the local pastor, how do you get 200 people in a church on a Tuesday night? <laughs> and the pastor said, <laughs> mm -hmm. listen to me. There are all kinds of gimmicks churches use to so-called hold people. Holding someone in a church building is not holding the person in Christ. There are two different things. You can hold someone in a building is the person in Christ. Only this, this keeps a person in Christ. In all my travels, I've observed this attracts old and young. Mm. And I get texts all, all the time, young people telling me they want to walk with God. God is my witness. Young people all the time, pastor, I have sinned. I want to get close to God. And I give them this this all right next question in one of your sermons you said that the devil this is the devil's world mm -hmm. could you explain that a little for yes me? let's pray again father as I continue answering questions for your beloved people continue to grant wisdom to the pastor and me in Jesus name I pray amen the temptations of Christ are found in two places Matthew 4 and Luke 4 in Matthew 4 is eat turn stones to bread jump off the building 
worship me. In Luke, it is turn stones to bread, worship me, jump off the building. Now, in Luke's version, Luke chapter 4, verse 6, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Satan is saying, all this was given to me. When? When Adam sinned. Are you with me? Now, when Jesus died, he bought it back. But it's not yet in his control. Are you with me? Christ legally bought the world back. The reason why Satan went up to heaven in Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. He came to represent the earth. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence camest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Symbolizing that's mine. Because when God promised Canaan to, to Abraham, he told him in Genesis 13, verse 16, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it. So God told Abraham to do exactly what Satan said he was doing. Expressing possession. And so in a certain sense, this is the devil's world. In John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus said, The prince of this world cometh. The word prince, the Greek word archon, means a ruler. And hath nothing in me. Second Corinthians 4, verse 4, Paul says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds. And so yes, in a practical sense, the devil, this is the devil's world. But Christ has bought it back legally. But the devil is still squatting. Along with his people. And Christ is coming to remove the squatters. Do not be among them. Get to Christ. When you're with Christ, you are legally inhabiting the world. You're not squatting. All right, let's, let's just have a follow-up to that. Yes. This, if you don't mind. Oh, follow-up. Okay. Uh, Pastor, so in a sense, God made an exception in allowing Satan into that meeting. Because we know that sin cannot exists in the presence of a holy God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was the question that the pastor was alluding no, to No, Satan, Satan did not stand in the full presence of God. Remember that uh, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Are you following me? The administrator of the universe is the creator. That's Christ. The same way the blood of Christ was effective from the foundation of the world, so was his humanity. So anyone coming, you see, you can't have blood shed without humanity. I don't want to be deep or tough. Think. Abraham was saved by the blood of Christ. Amen. Before it was shed. Are you with me? Yes. Noah by the blood of Christ. Well, it means the humanity of Christ had to be effective for his blood to be effective because the spirit can't bleed. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. And so, because of Christ he could come. But he couldn't come into the full presence of the Father. Through Christ, he could come up to heaven. Mm -hmm. and we don't know exactly where in heaven he was, you see. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Are people who don't keep, people who don't keep the Sabbath, will they make it to heaven? People who disobey God will be lost. Are you with me? People who willfully, deliberately, fragrantly, directly, high-handedly disobey God will be lost. Because if God saves them, sin will start all over again. So when the person says, well, those who don't keep the Sabbath will be lost, Martin Luther didn't keep the Sabbath. Hello, I said he'd be in the kingdom. William Miller didn't keep the Sabbath. He was not convicted. He'll be in the kingdom. During the Dark Ages, there were thousands and millions who knew nothing about the Sabbath because it was an age of darkness. But God knew the heart of those people. They'd be saved. But when in 1844, October 22, the temple was opened, then the light of the law flashed out all over the world. So that excuse is gone. Are you with me? Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right. This is not salvation by works. This is expressing your love through obedience. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I guess this kind of connects with the question is, can you explain imputed right righteousness? Imputed righteousness is what God does for us. Imparted righteousness, imputed righteousness is what he does in us. Uh, when you come to Christ, hmm, you sinner, I'm sorry, forgive me. Immediately, Christ's righteousness covers you. And his righteousness stands in your place. Now listen to what he said, stands in your place. Let me put it this way. You're in school, University of Missouri City, and you get F, E, G plus, H minus. Those are your grades. Are you with me? <laughs> now, you come to Christ. 
and you submit to him, read out Christ's score for me. A plus, A plus, A plus, A plus, A plus, plus, plus. Those are the grades Christ has in righteousness. He puts that to your name. When you come to him. Let me tell you why that's necessary. A perfect life. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. A perfect law requires a perfect life. You said amen, but did you get what I'm saying? A perfect law cannot tolerate an imperfect life. If it tolerated it, it ceases to be a perfect law. A perfect law demands a perfect life. Which means you have to be perfect in the past, in the present, and you must be perfect in the future. Are you with me? The only person who's lived that life is Christ. So when you come to Christ and you truly surrender, you're convicted by his love as expressed on Calvary, you want to do everything that pleases him. But the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You understand? Christ accepts you and covers you with his righteousness. And so Ella White writes in Step to Christ, page 62, paragraph 2, if you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake, you count it righteous. Christ's character is put in place of your character and you are accepted by God just as if you had never sinned. Okay, okay, uh, give me one minute, one minute. This is so astounding, people don't believe it. They don't believe it. The gospel is the most astonishing. That's why angels cannot understand it. That the very, listen to 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, God the Father, hath made him Christ to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, that's Christ who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We must be made righteous because we cannot make ourselves righteous. God, was, God made Jesus to be sin because Jesus never made himself sin by sinning. And so imputed righteousness is what is given to us when we come to Christ. The imparted righteousness is that power that takes us from day to day. One is our title to heaven. That's imputed. The other is our fitness for heaven. For instance, let's say my little brother is 12 and he's next in line to be king of some country in Europe somewhere. But he's only 12. Now he has to wait until he's 18. He has the title, but he does not have the fitness. Are you with me? Let me say it again. He has the title, but he doesn't have the fitness. So when you come to Christ, I'm sorry, like that publican in Luke 18, he left with the right, the title. He now had to develop the fitness, or Christ had to work out the fitness in him. And so imputed as a title, imparted provides the fitness for a place in God's kingdom. Yes, my brother. Sorry, sorry, one second. Hold on a second, please. You have a mic? Because the people, we want the people online to hear. So with what you just explained, then the dilemma in the church now is what we hear, people will be sinning until Jesus comes. No, 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 no. no. You see, the, look, look, at, look at Daniel. Daniel loved God so much. When he had the choice between sin and death, finish my words, he chose death. We have to come to that point. Look at the three Hebrew boys who refused to bow. They had a choice between bow and live and refuse to bow and die. They chose death, not knowing they'd be saved. Paul went to Jerusalem, Acts 20, saying, I know what's waiting for me, but I don't count my life precious. When you, you see, Hebrews 2, 14, verse 15, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Genuine surrender to Christ brings you to the place where you prefer to die than knowingly sin against God. No, we will come to the place where we will not sin. 
Mm -hmm. So no one believe this. We continue sinning till Jesus. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Listen to me. God put Adam out for one sin. He can't let you in with one. Is Jesus actually God? Yes. That's so heavy. Let me pray again. Father, I, Lord, as I deal with this, you talk to me. Just take me out of the way and just talk to me. Let me be possessed by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3. I recognize that young professor right there. <laughs> Do you have First Timothy chapter 3? Do you have verse 16? If you have the King James Version, read it with me carefully. Are we ready? Let's read. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Come on. God was manifest in the flesh. Stop. Now, stop, stop, stop. Thank you for being eager to read. God bless you. God was, come on, manifest in the flesh. That's the great mystery. Great mystery. But we must understand sufficient because as we understand it, it changes us. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, let's add to that. Go to Matthew 1. Matthew 1. Is Aaron back there? Could you take that picture off? <laughs> Please. You can put a Q&A on yeah, the yeah, previous one you yeah, had. Yeah, put something like that. Take off <laughs> that bald-headed vegetarian. All right. <laughs> Did I say Matthew chapter 1? Yes. All right. Let's read verse 21. Are you there? Read with me. And she shall bring forth a son. Come on. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sin. From how many sins? All their sin. Mm -hmm. Not some. All. Now, what is his work in verse 21? He saves them from their sin. But who is he? Go to verse 23. Who is this person that saves them from their sins? Read for me. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, come on, and shall bring forth a son, come on, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, what is the work he does in verse 21? Who is he in verse 23? God. Only God can save you. It's, a, it's, a, it's an error I see in the church. For those of us who believe, some Adventists believe Jesus is not equal with the Father. Yes. Only God can save you. Go to Romans chapter 1. Six forty-one. Do you have Romans one sixteen? You don't have it yet. It's in the New Testament. You have it now? <laughs> okay. Read with me. What does it say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Nice and loud. For it is the power of the angel Gabriel unto salvation. The power of God. Only the power of God can save you. Yes, Christ is God. Was Christ worshipped when he was on this earth? Because he was God and man at the same time. I never said Christ is the Father, but Christ is fully God. Go to Hebrews 1. And I'm glad this question was asked. You'd be amazed what people believe in the Adventist church. Which is not among the official doctrines, by the way. Do you have Hebrews 1? Yes. This is the Father speaking to the Son, one of my favorite chapters. Here's what the Father says in verse 8. And what does that read that for me? Thy throne, but of the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Stop. What does the Father call him? O God. O God. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. What is the Father saying? Jesus has a kingdom. When you read, read microscopically. Thank you very much. Verse 9 Thou hast loved righteousness. And hated iniquity. Skip to verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, 
and the heavens are the work of thy hand. Stop. The father says, who created heaven and earth? Come on, who? The son. Mm. Read verse 11. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Stop. What's that? What does that tell you about Jesus and creation? They shall perish. Creation will do what? Pass away. But thou, what does that mean? Christ is eternal. The Father is pro pro uh, proclaiming the eternal nature of Jesus. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as the death of garment. Huh? But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. That's eternal. Christ is an eternal being. Now, since the Father identified Christ as God, he called him Lord in verse 8. Lord, God in verse 8, Lord in verse 10. Let's go to Psalms 90. We know who the creator is. Let's go to Psalm 90. Somebody say amen for the Bible. Amen. You have Psalm 90? Yes. Read from verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth. Stop. Who brought the mountains forth? Jesus, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, finish it. Thou art God. Jesus is as divine as the Father. And the Holy Spirit is as divine as the Father. Now they have different functions. Are you with me? In divinity, they're like this. In function, they're like that. Are you with me? We have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equally divine, each one. But in function, we have Father, we have Son, we have Holy Spirit. Go to John 13, 16. I'm taking a little while, but this is important, Pastor. And we have from 6 until the sun sets. I didn't say I'll take all that time. I just said we have it from 6 until the sun sets. <laughs> Okay, where did I send you? John. What chapter? 13. What verse? 16. Now, most of the reading is coming from the left. Let me hear someone from the right read as well. I just keep hearing all the way from the left. But let's all read together. Are you with me? Read with me now. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Come on, neither he that is sent greater than him that sent him. Now, we have two people in that verse. Name them. The servant and the Lord. Who's greater? Come on. Be confident even if you're wrong. Who's greater? The Lord. And the Lord is the one who does what? He sends. Now, listen to John 17, 3. No, you don't have to go there. You know it. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And if you read John 5, John 17, whom hast sent have sent have sent have sent now it means with respect to authority who is higher the one who sends go to John 15 <laughs> somebody said okay <laughs> John 15 <laughs> read verse 20 are you there yes. what does that say read for me remember the word that I said unto you the servant is not greater than his Lord mm -hmm. if they have persecuted him, they will do what? Yes, if they did it to me, they won't do it to you. The servant is not greater. The one who sends is greater than the one who sent him. Now go to John 14. Let's read verse 28. Are you there? Read for me nice. What does it say? You have heard how I said unto you, I go to my way and come again unto you. If ye love me, you will rejoice, because I said what? I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now, in what sense is the Father greater? In the sense of authority and responsibility, not in the sense of divinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are fully divine. And what calls them the three great powers of heaven. Who are working for our salvation but with authority let me show you again the authority go to john 14. read verse 26. but the comforter come on which is the holy ghost whom the father shall send in my name stop 
the comforter, the Father will send him in my name. The name is the authority of Jesus. Now go to John 15. Read verse 26. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let's read together. Are we ready? Let's read. What does it say? But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall. Now Jesus says, I will send him in verse 26 of chapter 15. Jesus said the Father will send him, verse 26, John 14. In other words, the Father and the Son can send the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't send them anywhere. Now, when Christ was on earth in his humanity, the Spirit directed him. Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach. Yes, but as God, he sent that. What happened at Pentecost? Jesus sent the Spirit to give him tongues. Jesus is fully God. And if you don't believe that, you may have a nice religious life. But you cannot be saved by someone less than God. I say again, Jesus Christ. Let me give you one more verse. Go to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9. Are you there? Who can guess what verse I want you to read? Who can guess the verse? Someone who loves Jesus. Who can guess the verse? Six. Six. All right. Are you out there? Six. Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with us all as we listen to your word and try to understand under the guidance of your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read with me. For unto us a child is given. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Come on. Counselor. Come on. The mighty God. Stop. The mighty God. Keep reading. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. A better translation of everlasting father is the father of eternity. You see eternity flows from Jesus. That's a concept we can't understand because eternity has no end. But it comes, Jesus is the source of eternity. So he's the father, the everlasting father, the father of everlastingness. And he's called the mighty God. We need to understand this stupendous fact that the person in that manger with arms and legs wriggling in the air, helpless, was the one who said, let there be light. And he took that step. To save us. No one less than Christ. Could have come to die. Because he had to give up the life that is naturally his. If the angel Gabriel had come to die. He would have been giving up a life that's not his. Because he received life from the creator. Are you following me? The life had to be the life that naturally belongs to the victim. Dying on that cross. Only Christ can fulfill that. No angel could. But the angels wanted to come and die. No you can't die for sin. The life is not yours. I can die because the life is mine and so I give it up and I take it back up. Amen. Go to John, I keep saying one more verse, go to John 10. I want you to leave here understanding Jesus Christ is fully God. Don't put your salvation in peril by believing he's less than God. John 10, let's read from verse 16. And you found it, let me know. Amen. Read with me. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Keep reading. Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid on my life that I might take it again. Verse 18. No man taketh it from me. Stop. Jesus wasn't killed. Jesus gave up his life. Ah, you're saying yes because you're nice. But do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus gave up his life. If he had been killed, it would have been an unwilling sacrifice. Are you with me? He willingly gave up his life. So he says in verse 18, No man taketh it from me, but I laid down of myself. Now finish the verse. I have power to lay down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now stop. Wait a, bit. Wait a minute. No dead person can raise himself. Jesus raised himself. Now the Bible says the father raised him. The, father, the Bible says that because the father told him when to get up. But Jesus said destroy this temple and in three days I will raise him. If the father had raised him, Jesus would have need an assistant. No, Christ needs no assistant to save us. 
So Hebrews 1 verse 3, when he had by himself purged our sins. And to purge the sins required the death and the resurrection. Are you with me? To purge sins requires death and resurrection. Go back to the sanctuary. The sinner brought the lamb. The lamb was slain. That's the death of Christ. The priest is the living Christ. And he goes into the temple to apply the blood. You must have death and resurrection to have sins taken care of. Jesus Christ is fully God. Somebody say amen for Jesus. All right. Next question. All right. So we established the fact that Jesus Christ is fully God. Mm -hmm. Let's now deal with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Is the Holy Spirit a separate being? Mm -hmm. Is he the spirit of the Father, or the spirit of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Some argue that the Trinity is a Catholic teaching mm -hmm. and that the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church did not believe in the Trinity. Let me, listen to me carefully. When we hear the word heathen and pagan and Catholic, we start to panic. Are you with me? Now, do pagans eat breakfast? Yes. Do we eat breakfast? Yes. Is that pagan behavior? Are you following me? Is that, do, do pagans wear clothes? Yes. Do we wear clothes? Yes. Is that pagan behavior? No. Now, the Catholics believe in the Trinity. It doesn't make it wrong because they believe in the Trinity. They believe that Christ is fully God. That's not a Catholic doctrine. That's a biblical doctrine. Not everything Catholics believe is wrong. But where they're wrong, they are catastrophically wrong. Are you following me? No, you're not listening to me. So they believe some things that are biblical. And if you believe the Bible, you believe the same thing. The doctrine of the Trinity is biblical, not Catholic. Now let's go to Matthew 3. Matthew 3. You have Brother Matthew? Yes. Chapter 3. Yes. You read from verse 16. What happened that verse is exactly what happened this morning at uh, Baytown. All right, read with me. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now let's look at it microscopically. And I ask God to continue to be with this session. Please, in the name of Jesus. Where was Jesus? In the water. He was coming out. In what direction was the dove traveling? He was up now. So we have two different beings. Where does the dove sit? On the shoulder, the on the shoulder of Jesus. The voice we hear, where does it come from? Right above. So we have someone coming down. Now, the spirit can take any form. Remember in Acts 2, there were cloven tongues like as a fire. That's divine power, you see. We don't understand that. The Spirit came down, sat on Christ who was coming out of the water. And a voice said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We have Father, we have Son, we have Holy Ghost. Go to Matthew 28. The Bible is simple if we're honest. Mm -hmm. It's very simple when you're honest. I'm not trying to defend tradition. Matthew 28, reading from verse 18, read with me. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go on. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Ghost. Name represents character, power, and authority. Because Romans 8, 9 tells us, If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ... He is none of his. We must be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go to John 3, verse 8. Is the Holy Ghost a separate person? Is he divine? John 3, verse 8. It's three minutes to seven. Do you have John 3, verse 8? Yes. Read with me. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, what do you understand by born of the Spirit? What's that? Born again. The new birth, conversion, or justification by faith. Only God can do that. 
And Jesus says, the spirit is the force that carries out, that carries it out. Only God can deliver you from sin. Let's go to Acts 13. Acts 13, we read from verse 1. There are some names you need to pronounce carefully in that chapter, but go, undergo the discipline of pronouncing these names. Because we don't read the Bible because the names are different. Undergo the discipline of trying to pronounce. Don't quit and give up. You're a child of God. Christ fell. He got up. He fell. He got up. He walked up to Calvary. He kept falling. He kept getting up. They finally helped him, but he made it because he saw you. So never quit too easily. Quit sin quickly, but not other things. All right. Verse 1. Acts 13, what does that say? Now, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and as? Uh-huh. Nightman? Mm -hmm. Lucius? And Saul who had been brought up with Manaean. <laughs> okay. When you get home, read it again and it'll be much better. Okay, now... Verse 2 says what? As they ministered unto the Lord and fasted. Come on. The Holy Ghost said. Stop. Speech is one of the highest expressions of intelligence. That's why animals don't speak, although they're intelligent. The Holy Ghost said. What did he say? Keep reading. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have Mm -hmm. Now, look at verse 1 again. How many people were there? Read the names again. Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manan, and Saul. Now, five. The Holy Ghost said, I want how many? Two. He deliberately selected the two he wanted. That's the power of discrimination. To the work we're unto, finish verse 2, I have called them. Can electricity make a call to you to go preach for Christ? Can energy do that? The Holy Spirit is an individual, intelligent being. We don't understand him. By the way, for those of us who are tempted to think the Holy Ghost is less than anybody else, let me issue a biblical warning for you. Go to Matthew 12. Matthew 12. You have Matthew 12? Yes. Let's read from verse 31. You have Matthew 12. Are you there? Yes. What does that say? Where? Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven the men. But the blasphemy against the shall not be forgiven Read verse 32. And whoso speaketh a word against the Son of, it shall be. But whoso speaketh a word against the, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world. Come on, neither in the world. Be careful what you say about the Holy Spirit. You talk about Jesus, that forgiveness is possible. You run your tongue and your mouth against the Holy Spirit. And that's Jesus speaking. Be very careful how you talk about the Spirit of God. Now, we read in John 3, 8, the Spirit saves. He, he's the one who carries out the new birth. Go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Read for me verse 22. Are you there? Yes. Read for me. What does it say? Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Come on. For I am and there is. What does that mean that I am God? There is none else. Yes. Okay. What else? Read the whole verse. Look unto me and be saved. Stop. That's the activity. Be Look and be saved. Now he says, for I am God. There is none else. What does he mean by that? I am the only one who can save you. But we read in John 3, 8. The new birth is brought about by the Spirit. And Jesus himself said that. Then the Spirit must be fully God. Because only God can save you. Amen. All right. 
Next question. A lot of Seventh-day Adventists believe that wearing jewelry, example, earrings, chains, are not a sin and that they can wear them. Some also believe that body tattoos are not sin. What does God say? All right. I knew trouble was coming sooner or later. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, give us a heart to receive biblical truth and not social customs. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go to Genesis 3. We read verse 6 and verse 7. Well, let's read from 1 to 7. Read the Bible. Genesis 3, 1 to 7, we're talking about ornaments and decorations on the outside, all that stuff we call jewelry, which is such a big business. Do you have it? Amen. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, he shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, which it was not, by the way, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, verse 8, and the eyes of them both were open, verse 7, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. What was made in verse 7? What? What was made? Be specific. Aprons of? Leaves. Let's go to verse 21. Read for me. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Okay, I want to draw some of your attention. What was made on the first day? Too slow, too slow, too slow. Light. Second day. For a moment, third day. Is this an Adventist church, Pastor? <laughs> Fourth day. Sun, moon, and stars. Fifth day. Birds and fish. Sixth day. Land animals and human beings. Question for you. What did Adam and Eve make in that week of creation? Nothing. Nothing. All the making, the creating was done by God. Go back to Genesis 3, 7. We're looking at a principle, a negative principle. Read verse 7 again. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. Stop. Read verse 25 of chapter 2. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Are you with me? But that was before sin. After sin, they're ashamed. So what are they trying to deal with? The embarrassment, the shame, the guilt. That's what they're trying to handle. How do they handle it? They made aprons of leaves. Now, that's the first thing the Bible records a human being ever made on the earth. Something to cover where? The outside. Are ah, you not listening to me? Something to beautify the outside. Something to help me feel a little better about myself. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. With this principle in mind, now, let's go to Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3. Are you there? Not yet? Come on, come on, find Zechariah. Find Malachi, then work your way back, Malachi. Okay, you got it now? You sure? Yes. I said Zechariah. Yes. You have Zechariah. Yes. Chapter 3. Yes. What's the first word in there? 
and he showed me joshua the high priest come on standing before the angel of the lord and satan standing at his right hand to resist him keep reading and he unto satan the lord rebuke thee o satan even the lord that hath chosen jerusalem rebuke thee is not this a brand plucked out of the fire verse 3 now joshua was clothed with filthy garments stop describe the leaves filthy garments because god had to remove them are you following me filthy garments now joshua was clothed in filthy garments and stood before the angel keep reading and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him saying what take away the filthy garments from him and to him he said behold i have caused that iniquity to pass from thee and i will clothe thee with change of raiment now in joshua we have a symbol of how god functions he removes that man-made stuff and replaces it with the symbol of the righteousness of his son are you with me now let's go back to genesis genesis 3 21 keep the information from zechariah 3 verse 1 to 4. let's go to genesis 3 verse 21 and to adam also and to his wife did the lord god make coats of skins and clothe them before he put the skins on what did he have to remove those aprons of leaves man-made for the purpose of feeling better reducing a sense of guilt and shame now to see how worthless the aprons were let's go to verse 8 of genesis 3 and they heard the voice of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day and adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the lord god amongst the trees of the garden now why are they hiding if they're already covered because there's no human covering that can improve your appearance in the sight of God. Are you following me? No, nah, you're not following me. Verse 21, coats of skin, the blood of Christ is what needs to cover us. Now, having said all of that, let us go to Exodus, Exodus, no, Genesis 35. It's 10 after 7. When does the sun set? It what? <laughs> temperance in all things temperance temperance okay we're going to genesis 35 we read from verse 1 let me pray father as we continue please lord teach us we want to know because salvation is knowledge teach us dear god in the name of jesus christ i pray amen now let me set this up for you in chapter 34 simeon and levi kill all the men in the city because the prince of that city had raped their sister. Jacob had 13 children, 12 boys and one girl. You know that girl is going to be protected. When she was raped, Simeon and Levi went to the city and said to the prince, Look, you defiled our sister. You have to marry her. The prince said, Yeah, I'll marry her. But the boy said, You can't marry her because you're uncircumcised. The prince said, We'll get circumcised. So Simeon and Levi, the servants, came in, circumcised all the men. Waited three days for them to be properly immobile. Are you following me? <laughs> then came with the swords and killed all the men. Brought the women into captivity and the children, all the possessions of the city and in the field and took it all away. Now, when this terrible thing happened, Jacob said the surrounding tribes will kill me because I'm just a small group. Now, God is going to get them out of this. Are you following me? He's getting them out of this crisis. That's what we're about to read. Verse 1, Genesis 35. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up Bethel and dwell there, and make thee an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Remember Jacob running from Esau? Okay. Verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. This is a spiritual change. You've offended God. Changes have to be made. Put away the strange gods, be clean, change your garments. Now, verse 3. What does that say? And let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God that what? Answered me in the day of my distress and which was with me in the way which I went. Now, Jacob said in verse 2, Put away the strange gods, be clean, change your garment. Verse 4, read with me now. 
And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hands, and all the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Now, all the jewelry Jacob took and buried it. Go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, we'll read from verse 14. Are you with me? Yes. You have Matthew 25? Yes. Verse 14? Yes. Okay, you say yes, but you're still turning pages. All right, okay. <laughs> okay. Are we there now? Can I rely on that? Yes. Okay, read with me. For the kingdom of is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Next verse. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several abilities, and straightway took his journey. Now, next verse. 16, I think it is. Now he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. Read verse 18. Went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. What did Jacob do with the jewelry? In the earth. What does this man do with the talent? Signifying what? How did the fellow with five get ten? What did he do? Yes, he traded. He used it. Are you with me? Are you following? He used it. Got, went from five to ten. What about the fellow who went from two to four? He used it. He put it to use. The fellow with one, what did he do? He buried it. Meaning what? He didn't use it. What did Jacob do with that jewelry? He buried it. It was not to be used. Go to Exodus 33. Exodus 33. We have another crisis. <laughs> the Israelites were full of crises. We have another crisis. These people have just worshipped the golden calf. And God was this close to wiping them out. Moses sent the, the Levites with their swords. 3,000 were killed in that day. Now God wants them to do something to show repentance and a change of mind and heart. Verse 1, uh, Exodus 33. Let me know when you're there. Read with me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. Keep reading. And I will send my angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now, verse 3. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Keep reading. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for ye are a, thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you in the way. God is saying, I am so mad. I don't want to travel with you in your condition because I'll just destroy you. Hmm. Is God love? Yes. Can God get mad? Is his madness just? Yes. Verse 4. And when the people heard these evil tidings, come on, they mourned, and no man did put on him. He, they, they refused to put on all the jewelry they had. Verse 5. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee verse 6 and the children of israel stripped themselves of the ornaments by the mount horeb now let me tell you the hebrew rendering strip themselves by the mount means from the mount horeb meaning from that point on they left them off from mount horeb they left them off subsequent travels we have two spiritual crises, and God says you need to straight yourself out. On each occasion, get rid of all that stuff. Now, go to Ezekiel 28. Let's read from verse 13. This is a description of Lucifer. 
before he fell. Are you with me? I'm not convinced you are, but okay. Ezekiel 28, reading from verse 13. Are you there? Okay, some of you still looking for Ezekiel. All right, I give you 10 seconds to find Ezekiel. It's 718. You have Ezekiel 28, 18, 13. Read with me. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Come on. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond. What else? The beryl, onyx, the jasper. What else? The sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. Keep reading. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Who is that? Lucifer. He was covered with precious stones. Let's find out what his problem was. Go to verse 17 and read it for me. Come on. Thine heart was lifted up in thee. Why? Because of thy beauty. Come on. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Stop. When Lucifer realized how pretty he was, thine heart was lifted up in thee because of of thy beauty. You know, you went to high school, the most stuck up person was the girl who thought she was the prettiest. <laughs> his outward appearance led to his, I'm not saying that's the only reason, but it contributed. Now, when God made Lucifer, he was covered with all that stuff. When God made Adam, was there sin in the world, in the universe? When God made Adam, was there sin in the universe? Yes! Who would send for Lucifer? Are you with me? So did God know the catastrophe he had with this pretty angel? Mm. How did he make Adam? Give me one word starts with N. Naked. What did he have on him? Nothing. What did Eve have on her? Nothing. <laughs> now, does God want us to breathe? What did he give us? With two holes. Are you with me? <laughs> oh, you're not listening. Does he want us to listen? Yes. What did he give us? To hear with holes. If he wanted us to wear earrings, he could have put another hole right here and one right here. Ah, uh, you don't like me anymore. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Yeah? He made Adam and Eve with nothing on them. A baby comes out of the womb and two days later, you pound a hole in the ear. And you pound in the ear and you drive a, a screwdriver through something. And you cuff some with a saw to hang metal. Let me tell you something about jewelry in ancient times. People wore them to identify with their idols. Some jewelry formed were called amulets. An amulet was devised to protect you from evil spirits. Some jewelry had markings on them that represented the idols. And as the idols were decorated, people decorate themselves so they look like, come on, their idols. Go to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. Oh, I forgot to welcome those listening online. Wherever you are, God bless you. And may the truth of his word reach you unopposed. What book did I say? Leviticus, what chapter? 19. Read verse 28 microscopically. Are you there? And keep in mind, the key word that describes or summarizes Leviticus is holiness. Read verse 28 now. Ye shall make no cuttings in your flesh for the dead, or print marks upon you, I am now. Don't cut yourself. Don't print marks on you. That's what people did to identify with the dead and their ancestors whom they worship. Are you following me? Remember the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel with Elijah? When Baal wouldn't answer, what did they start to do? Cut them down. Don't, don't do that. Now, when God says don't cut yourself, what does he mean? Don't cut yourself. Don't tell God well, it's a little cut. <laughs> ah, pastor, they don't like what I'm saying. Don't tell God, but it's just a little cut. Because Adam could have said, it's just a grape. <laughs> That's all I consumed. 
Why are you putting me out? God said, don't do it. Now, to have earrings in your ear, do you have to pierce it? Or some? Do you have it? Is that a cut? Why are you hesitating as though you... Why stammer? Is that a cut? Yes. Don't make me mad. <laughs> the verse says, don't print any marks on your body. Are your toes a part of your body? Come on, tell me. You don't sound sure, huh? Why are they red? That's a mark. Now, someone is saying, this guy's extreme. I'm not extreme. You either for God or you're not. Now, let me say this. Some people are convicted at different times. Different time. I was preaching somewhere and I made a call to give up all that jewelry. People came and put rings and it on the table. I told the head elder, the pastor, sell it and give the money to the Dorcas Society. They took it off and put it there. Mm -hmm. Go to First Timothy chapter 2. I know someone watching me wants to kill me, but the pastor's here to protect me. He won't let me get killed. You want to kill me? I know that. I feel that heat coming from you. First Timothy chapter 2. Let's read from verse 9. I'll miss you when I'm gone. I really will. God bless you all the days of your life. God bless you. God bless you. I mean it. First, Peter, First Timothy chapter 2. Do you have that? Yes. Let me pray. Father, as we continue, teach us God. We forget quickly. Teach us and soften that stony heart that does not like what is being said. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First Timothy 2 verse 9 says what? In like manner also that women adorn themselves with modest apparel, in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Let me tell you something. Modesty is almost extinct. When I was a boy, you knew what a modest person looked like. <laughs> modesty today is almost extinct. People in the church no longer understand what modesty is. I was coming through Johannesburg, South Africa. And, uh, oh. <laughs> okay. and I saw a lady dressed. And the moment I saw her, I was impressed with the modesty of which she was dressed. I wanted to go and tell her, but as a preacher, you can't just do these things. Because people misunderstand you. But I said, Lord, bless that woman. You can tell she respected herself. And she was not advertising for a man. Are you following me? She was just dressed modestly covered. And I, I looked at her, I admired her. I said, God, bless that woman. Modesty means very little in the church today. Are you with me? Because our standards are not biblical or Ellen White. They are the world. Finish verse 9 of 1 Timothy 2 again. What does that say? In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sub In other words, you ought to be ashamed if you walk out of the house looking like that. Come on, not with or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, there's controversy as to what broided hair means, and I have no position on it. But what we do know, there are some hairstyles the Bible condemns. Are you with me? Yes. Now, some people were chatting. All right. Whether or not you understand what broided hair means, it does tell us there are some hairstyles that God does not approve of. They do not reflect Christian modesty. Now, you can decide if yours falls under that or not. I'm not here to do that, but I'll tell you that verse condemns certain hairstyles. But there's a Holy Spirit that convicts you if you're genuine with God. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. We read from verse 1. 1 Peter 3, reading from verse 1. Have you found that? No, some people are still looking. All right, we'll wait. Patience is a virtue. We'll wait. You have five seconds. You have it now? Read with me. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. If any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wife. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Let me explain that. What Peter is telling women who marry to unconverted men. Don't nag the man. Let him see your holy life and that you still respect him as your husband. Let him see that and that will win him. Don't insist he comes to church. 
he's an adult. Don't badger him until he seeks mental help. Leave the man alone. Just be faithful to God. <laughs> Respect him as your husband, and that will do the work. All right. Now, they also may without the word be won by the conscience of the wife. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Read verse 3. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of? Letting the hair again or of? Or of putting on of apparel, meaning very expensive clothes. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. So we have corruptible in verse 4. Then what is corruptible? What is in verse 3? Read verse 3 again. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of? Uh, or? Wearing of gold or putting of apparel, expensive clothes, gold, all the weaves, whatever people do. That is corruptible, meaning it passes away. Verse 4 says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. What's the number three? Is of no value to God. What's the number four? Is of great value to God. And you child of God, your first interest is what is important to God. Now read verse 5. Interesting verse. For after this manner, all time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. Stop. That's how the holy women of the old conducted themselves. Modestly. That's what the Bible says. Now, let me finish on jewelry with this. Go to Matthew, not Matthew. Revelation 12. I know the subject is not popular. <laughs> I know that. You're as quiet as a graveyard. Okay, Revelation 12. <laughs> Do you have Revelation 12? Let's read from verse 1. <laughs> read with me. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Stop. Describe how this woman is adorned. How is she described? Clothed with the sun. What does the sun give? Light. What were Adam and Eve surrounded by before they sinned? Light. Keep reading. The moon under her feet. What does the moon give? Light. And upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. What do the stars give? Light. When were they made? Genesis 1. Sun, moon, and stars. One of the reasons was, let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the earth to give light upon the earth. She is adorned in the light. Go to Revelation 17. Let's look at another woman. You have Revelation 17? Let's read verse 4. What does that say? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold, precious stone, and pearl. What do you understand by decked? Hmm? Mm -hmm. There's a word the rap world gave us. Bling. Are you following me? <laughs> Watch out now. <laughs> That's what I care from the rap world gave us. Bling. I mean, the woman in Revelation 17, she is bling, bling. It used to be bling, bling. Then they shorten it to bling. That's what describes her. She was decked. Hey, couldn't walk straight. So heavy with jewelry. Now, listen to me carefully. The one in 12 is adorned in the light of Christ. The one in 17 with all the precious stones and jewelry. The one in 12 represents God's true church. The one in 17, the corrupt church. You choose which one you'd like to look like when you dress. I'm not telling you. You choose. Now let's get off to some pleasant subject. What's the next question? Uh, I, I'm not sure if this one is pleasant. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> what does the Bible say about divorce and remarriage? Mm. Are adult, adult, well, adultery and mm -hmm. death the, of the spouse, okay, the only ground for remarrying someone else. Can you marry someone who, someone, if, someone who has been divorced? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, there's usually a simple answer for what sounds like a complex question. Tell me what to tell your people.
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible has one clear reason for divorce. One clear reason. Adultery. The church may give you several more. Are you with me? The Bible has one clear reason for the divorce. That's adultery. You cannot divorce a woman because she can't cook or because, you know, whatever. Adultery. That's why when you consider marriage, think twice. But once you're in it, you're stuck. Are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> well, stuck's not a good word. You're in for life. So think twice. You can't jump in and jump out because she broke a fingernail. You can't do that. Now, adultery is the reason for divorce. Now, the, the Bible, Ellen White makes it very clear, the innocent party can remarry. The guilty party must be, remain single for life. Of course, it doesn't happen because we do what we want. The innocent party can remarry. But God prefers reconciliation. Malachi 2 verse 6, the Lord of Israel saith that he hateth putting away. Calvary shows that God prefers reconciliation to divorce. Are you with me? But adultery is the clear biblical reason for divorce. The innocent party can remarry. The guilty party must remain single. So yes, you can marry a divorced person if you determine that the person has been divorced and the person is innocent. Because if someone decides to divorce you, there's very little you can do. Are you following me? It doesn't mean that you're a, a monster because you got divorced. It may not have been your fault at all. So an innocent person can remarry or can be married by someone. But the clear biblical reason for divorce is adultery but the church allows others, presumably based on the Bible. All right. But remember, when the flood came, they were marrying and giving in marriage. Are you following me? Don't make the desire for marriage a God. There's some women, and let me pick on the women, that's all they think about. And they run into trouble. They marry the first man with a pulse. Are you following me? And they run into trouble. Mm-hmm. Go on. In Exodus 28, God gives us instructions about how we should keep the Sabbath day mm -hmm, holy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of Seventh-day Adventists don't believe that it applies to strangers or individuals that are within their gates. Mm -hmm. They allow them to watch TV, mm -hmm. stay in their homes when they go to church and do whatever they want to do. Will individuals be a, that allow them to do this on the Sabbath be charged by God? Mm -hmm. Will it be considered a sin on their part, even though they're not the ones doing it? Let's recite the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Pause. Pause. That includes doctors and nurses. But let me add something before you call the police. Let me add something. <laughs> Ella White writes in Medical Missionary, page 216, paragraph 2. It may be necessary for a doctor or nurse to go in. In that case, go, because it's proper to ease suffering on the Sabbath. But only do what is required to relieve suffering. And whatever money you paid, give it to the church. So don't go on Sabbath saying, I'm a nurse, but knowing you want time and a half. Every act is judged by the motive. Thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. If it's your home, you are responsible. What happens in that home? You cannot say he's my cousin. Because God made Adam and put him out. Are you following me? You can't say he's my cousin, let him do what he wants. No, 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 no. As long as he's in your home, he is to follow the rules. Now, you cannot convert him. But you can let him know, in this house, there's no TV on Sabbath. There's no smoking. There's no dominoes for you West Indians. There's no, th <laughs> there's no such thing on the Sabbath day. If you don't like it, well, you can spend that day elsewhere and then come back at sunset. Are you with me? We must put God first. 
the honor of God above the comfort of man. If it's your home, you must be responsible for the atmosphere in that home on Sabbath or any other day of the week for that matter. So yes, God holds you responsible for allowing in your house what should not happen on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Strictness is not harshness. God said, don't touch the ark. Uzzah, trying to help, he touched the ark. And we know what happened to him. But God has said, don't touch it. And God does not joke. Next question. That was actually the last question. Oh, I don't God know. is good. God is good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been going all day. <laughs> and uh, it's good to rest even. There's a hand. Okay, all there are two right, hands. Okay. All right, so let's um, use the mic so that we can... Okay. Don't let, don't let these hands turn into a forest, oh, all right? Danny put me on the spot. Okay. Yes. All right. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. okay, go ahead, sister. talking about oh. the doctors and the nurses yes. working on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You know, in regards to healing mm -hmm. on the Sabbath. So mm -hmm. say they weren't getting paid on the Sabbath, mm -hmm. would that change things? You don't work on the Sabbath. Okay. Jesus said it's lawful to do good. He did not say it's lawful to work. You see, mm -hmm. if you excuse Sabbath work, which grains pay, then you must excuse the fireman. And you must excuse, because they have good arguments, you must excuse the policeman. Right. You may have to excuse the FBI agent. There are quite a few evidence of FBI agent. Okay. The ten churches in Washington, D.C. We cannot make an exception for any commandment. Okay. Once you do that, you open the floodgates to make exceptions for all the other nine. In it, thou shalt not do any work. And trust God to take care of you. There's a reason why God did not send manna on Sabbath. Okay. Manna means that which keeps you alive, you understand? Because they complained they were hungry, they're about to die. He sent manna, but not on Sabbath. Which means God does not provide a living on the Sabbath. Mm. As I said, sometime, I don't know to whom, if you make a living on the Sabbath, it didn't come from God. Okay. It did not come from God. The devil can give you things. Don't misunderstand me, but it did not come from God. Yes. Uh, can you repeat the um, uh, text from Medical Missionary? Page 216, paragraph 2. Page 216, paragraph 2. Mm -hmm. The you. chapter is the, the, the sanitarium family, something like that. All right. Where's the other hand? Pastor, I know the answer to the question. I'm going to ask you. All right. But to my friend here, mm -hmm. I want him to hear it from you. Okay. Um, if you were baptized in another faith. Yes. And you come to the Seventh-day Adventist, mm -hmm. shouldn't you rebaptize? The strong um, uh, counsel is to get rebaptized. Now, in Acts chapter 19, Paul met 12 disciples who had been baptized. By John, Acts 19, 1 to 7. John said, unto which, Paul said, unto which baptism were you baptized? He said, John's baptism. John, they said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you were baptized? He said, we never heard about the Holy Ghost. What? He taught them, then they were rebaptized. When you realize you're coming to a system of truth you were not familiar with, of course, it's up to the spirit to convict you. Your decision should be, let me be rebaptized and start all over in this new system of truth. The recommendation, it's not a command, it's a recommendation, be rebaptized. I was preaching somewhere, way over the seas, and uh, I made a call for baptism, rebaptism. Fifty people came. My call was, look, you've been with God 40 years, but you haven't grown. It's just a routine. It's just you're going through the motions. You need to start again. And 50 people came. And I took them aside to a room to speak to them. And a retired minister joined me. And he told us a very interesting story. In the middle of his ministry, he decided to be rebaptized because he realized he hadn't grown. He was passing the church. They were baptism. The tithe was fine. But he himself was not really growing. So he went to the conference and said, Mr. President, I want to be rebaptized. The president said, what did you do? Oh, I didn't do anything. But I realize my spiritual life has been just nothing. 
and I just can't go through the motions. I want to be rebaptized. The president said, okay, we'll rebaptize you at night. <laughs> the pastor said, no, baptize me in front of my church because there are other members who need to make the same step. Let them see. And he was rebaptized. I was preaching in another city. The associate pastor got rebaptized. I was in another city preaching. The pastor's wife and his son got rebaptized because something about the word revived them. Evangelism, page 375, Ella White writes, When a soul is truly reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. Let him renew his covenant with God, and God will renew his covenant with him. Reconversion must take place in the churches. Amen. The strong counsel of the churches get rebaptized. New beginning. All right, who has the next hand? Yes, my brother. Yes, good evening, Pastor. Thank you for everything. I have a question concerning yes. our communion services. It looks like things have been changing. All right. How I was brought up in, in, or when I came into the church, I was mm -hmm. taught that mm -hmm. in, when having communion service, the morning part of the service, you know, you, the pastor preaches a sermonette concerning mm -hmm. the, the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you wash feet. Mm -hmm. Then you come and, and you come and partake of right. the communion yeah, service. Mm -hmm. And then when you leave, you know, they, they left singing a, a hymn. Right. right? Mm -hmm. um, what I've seen or what was tried to, that was um, tried to be implemented was everything done, be done in the morning part, mm -hmm. the washing of the field, and then preach the sermon, and mm -hmm. then have benediction, mm -hmm. and leave. Mm -hmm. So I stated, you know, well, how I understood it in Mark. And then you leave? Yes, when sir. When do you yes, partake sir. of the emblems? Yes, sir, and then you sing, and then we leave. Uh -huh. either after the, the hymn we sung, mm -hmm. and, and we leave singing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's, what's your take on... No, I'm, I, I didn't catch the difference, though. I didn't catch the difference. Oh, sorry? You said the new thing you're seeing is what? Oh, well, mm -hmm. well, the new thing, they, they, they switch it around. So instead of having everything in the evening, oh, uh -huh. sorry, the, the washing of the feet after, after the sermon, they, mm -hmm. they want to do everything, the washing of the feet, mm -hmm. the communion service first, mm -hmm. and then they'll preach a, a sermon, mm -hmm. and then have a, 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 do a benediction to close the service. Mm -hmm. So is that also accepted? Oh, no feet washing? No, no. no. He's saying... Uh -huh. that that the preaching came after the communion. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Uh, there's no biblical mandate for when the preaching should come. It's a matter of style and preference. The preaching can come anywhere. Yeah, it come, can come anywhere. Um, it doesn't have to be before the emblems or after. It depends on what the people prefer. Yes, it's a choice. It's a choice. I mean, you look at every church, they're a list of all preliminaries. They vary from church to church. I've been to churches to preach. I had to wait 90 minutes before I spoke. There were 90 minutes of preliminaries. And maybe the church baptized five people in 40 years, but they have 90 minutes of preliminaries. Are you following me? And I can understand it. But anyway, it's a personal choice. It's a personal choice. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. For instance, you have offering. Am I first? Right? Then you have what a morning prayer or whatever. You can switch that around. Now, it accepts people. You have morning prayer before the offering. Some people get very upset if you change the order of service. The order of service is not a biblical mandate. It depends on the individual church. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. God bless you. Yes, sister. This question concerns those who work in the medical field. Yes. The nurses, mm -hmm. doctors. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to our institution, mm -hmm. our hospitals yes. and so forth? Mm -hmm. Should they pay? Because they have to work on Sabbath. Yeah, they you? pay. They pay. In many things we do, sister, we're just like the world. In many, now this is my church, I'll die for it. You can't get me out of this church except in a coffin. But I also know there are many things we do that are simply influenced by the world. Whether it's our hospitals, our schools, our publishing houses, you know, I just, sometimes you shake your head and you realize the Israelites were no different. They were God's people, but crazy. And we are very much that way. But don't give up hope. This is God's church. It is the object still of his supreme regard. I was in an Adventist bookstore once, and they have books by T.D. Jake and this. But I said, well, what's the problem here? And you know, this, come on. Are we here to make a difference or not? You go to our hospitals, you see a vending machine with Coke and Sprite, and you know, we have a health message. But we're still God's people. And God has to spank us sometimes to get us straight.
So don't be discouraged, sister. We're still God's people. Pray, do what you can. God will fix this church. When he does, it'll be painful. Uh, I need a pastor's permission. Yes, um, Pastor, I have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, last week, you on your topic, um, obedience has side effects. Yes, and bless again, you. this yes. morning, you spoke about the, the Sabbath. And so um, I have friends, and from time to time, we have you know, discussions about the seventh day. The seventh day, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. and so I have, I have one friend, mm -hmm. and he says, well, the Bible doesn't, the Bible didn't say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, it says first, second, third, fourth, fifth, right. sixth. The True. only day that it named was the Sabbath. Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So his argument is um, Wednesday could be the first day. So my seventh day could be the following Wednesday. Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. Why can I, you know, worship on that day, yes. make that okay. day holy? All right. So okay. my question is, mm -hmm. since, um, you know, God named first, second, third, fourth, fifth, mm -hmm. man made the days Sunday, mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. How do you? All right. Okay. Adventists have a Bible study method called here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. All right. Let me ask you this. On what day was Jesus, did Jesus rise from the tomb? The Bible says all the first day. All consistently the first day. Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's first day. Now, let's forget Adventists for a while. On which day do Christians celebrate Easter? Easter. All Christians celebrate Easter on Sunday because they know from the Bible what happened on that day. That's when, G you see, Easter celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. So the, your friend who has a problem, let him look at Easter. Now, on what day was Christ crucified? They also celebrate it. It's called what? Good Friday. And there's no argument. The whole Christian world celebrates. You look at your calendars and you'll see Easter is on a Sunday. Now you tell me, what's the day between Friday and Saturday? There's Saturday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Simple, if you're honest and you're thinking. The Bible does not leave us with doubt on critical issues. We have to think. The, the Catholics celebrate Easter on Sunday. The same people who changed the law, huh? They celebrate Easter on Sunday. They celebrate Good Friday on Friday, Ash Wednesday on Wednesday, and Holy Thursday on Thursday. Are you following me? And there's also an entire nation that has been on the earth for thousands of years who know when the seventh day is, the Jewish nation. All right. May God lead your friend to light. Pastor, you're my boss. You tell me who to answer. Two more, two more, two more. Two more. Okay. All right, pastor, pastor said two more. All right. And the case is closed. Yes. <laughs> Uh, two questions. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor. Okay, Professor. <laughs> uh, yes. Number one. Mm. It's competitive sports. Yes. Acknowledged by God. Mm. Is what? Is it acknowledged by God? Acknowledged? Yes. Okay, okay. And the other question is... Mm -hmm. And properly doing communion, partaking of communion, right. foot washing is necessary. Uh -huh. Because of the situation we're in now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. should we fear that as a people of God? Should we do what? Fear foot washing as a people of God. Okay, all right. So those are the questions. Okay, all right. Let me get to them. One, competitive sports. They are not of God. They're contrary to the spirit of Christ. Christ's spirit is, I lose so you can win. That's Calvary. I lose. For your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Competitive sports says, I will do everything I can to stop you from scoring one goal. I will slam you into the boards in ice hockey. I will break your legs in football. I will look, undercut you in basketball. I will whatever. Mm -mm. Competitive sports are not of God. I'm upsetting those of you who worship Arsenal, Manchester United. Competitive sports are not of God. This is the Houston Astros or whatever. They are not of God. Are you with me? Recreation is of God. 
Difference, I remember many years ago, I was in the house of a friend of mine, and he had a table tennis in the basement. So he and I were just hitting the ball. He said, let's play a game. I said, why? <laughs> Come on, let's play. Why? Let's hit the ball. Come on, let's play a game. So we played, I beat him 21-5. <laughs> Uh -huh. And that was the end of his desire to play a game. He wanted someone to win or lose. This is not the spirit of God. You see it on pickup games on the playgrounds. Someone fouled. No, I didn't foul. You fouled. You look like a foul. You fouled. No, not me. They put their hands up. Lying. Mm -hmm. Lying. Uh-uh. Mm -mm -mm. Competitive sports are not of God. What was the other one? Or foot washing. We shouldn't fear doing what God has told us to do. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. We shouldn't fear it. Let me tell you something. God said don't cook on Sabbath. Is this mic working? <laughs> the Bible tells us do not cook on Sabbath. Cook. That's why there's a preparation day. An entire day. Now, did the Bible say that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? If he kept the food fresh in the days of the manna, can he keep the, keep the food fresh today? Yes! Whether you have a fridge or not. Because God rewards obedience. Are you listening to me? Do not cook on Sabbath. Now, L.O.I. says you can warm the food. But don't get cute and make it a cookish warming. Are you following me? Just warm it. We're always trying to get around God. Well, I'm not cooking. I'm warming up the cooking. No, no, no. Don't cook. But you can warm it. But when God says do it, do it. Do not be afraid. All right. Well, Pastor, is that it? One more. One more. Who is that person? Oh, my good brother. Yes. Yes. If you have an art with your brother. Yes. And you go to him mm -hmm. and you apologize. Mm-hmm. And he says, I, I, I don't accept your mm -hmm. apology. Mm -hmm. what, what is the state of that? Good question. There are a lot of problems in churches because members will not apologize to each other. They prefer to go gossip instead of following Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If we would do that, step one. We would cut out a lot of interpersonal problems in the church. But we call our friends, we text this person, we Skype that person, we, we, you know, and we discuss it and damage the person. The biblical method is always best. If someone has offended you, go to that person. It provides release for you and a chance for the person to be free from the guilt. If the person does not accept you, then there's nothing you can do. But you can try again. Mm-hmm. Because Jesus said 70 times 7 he was willing to forgive. You can try again. But if it's clear the person is not, you have done your part and God accepts that. Because the person is as much required by God to accept your confession or your uh, apology as you are to give it. Both things must work. But some people, they wrap their arms and no, I'm not accepting your apology. That is not of God. Mm -mm. The greatest offense is sin and God accepts our apologies when we confess we're to be like him. All right, that's the end of it. My, my brothers and sisters, may God bless you. Listen to me carefully. Study the word of God, please. Christ Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. The scriptures are the chief agency in the transformation of character. Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Elamite says, if studied and obeyed the word of god works in the heart subduing every unholy attribute when christ comes back he raises the dead with the word until then he will sustain us by the word and take time to read the writings of ellen white please god bless you wherever you are if i come across your mind please say lord put your words in that man's mouth. God bless you.